I'm George Curtis. Welcome to It's Your Law. Each week it's my privilege to bring you guests that help all of us understand our law, our history, our aims, our goals, our successes, and our failures. This is an election year. We're going to elect a president. I guess if you have a television set, a radio, or a newspaper, you already knew that. It's pretty important. I have no illusion of the right to tell you who to vote for. I don't know who I'm voting for. We've had some great presidents, and we've had some clinkers. Who our president happens to be and how she or he behave make a big difference to our country and for a long, long time. This gives us an opportunity to discuss somebody who I think is perhaps our greatest president. And if you're from the northern half of this country, you'll probably agree with me. His name is Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president, was our president during a very, very critical time when our nation was torn apart. And I have a couple of guests who know a thousand times more about Abraham Lincoln than I do, and it's about time you met one of them. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. It's Dr. Tom, is it not? It is. I'm a, a adjunct professor over at the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. And you teach history. I do. And uh, again, I cr uh, teach across the board as far as American uh, history, uh, that would be survey courses, but also uh, upper division courses, and uh, my specialty there would be a little bit more in the area of the 19th century U.S. history. So you have uh, mm -hmm. studied, taught, and actually written books of the uh, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, the periods of time uh, when we had uh, Lincoln, a Civil War, uh, slavery, uh, just about everything yes. that really put this country back together again when it was falling apart. Yes, uh, I've done a couple of interpretive presidential, uh, well actually three, um, uh, interpretive uh, biographies of presidents of uh, Millard Fillmore, uh, Franklin Pierce, and what unknown. Uh, on the other end of the bookend from Lincoln I would have done one on Grant and I also did a book on uh, uh, Lincoln's nemesis during the Civil War, which was uh, commanding general of the Army of the Potomac, uh, George B. McClellan. So, All right. What is your thought of Lincoln and how he ranks among our presidents? Um, you know, my own personal uh, bias in this regard is to rank him as the greatest president. Uh, you know, the, uh, every year you'll see some kind of a survey conducted. Now it's mostly done online, where scholars and enthusiasts and political sciences, scientists will weigh in on the ranking of presidents. And uh, no matter what, Lincoln almost always appears as in the number one or two positions, and I think it's uh, well deserved. Uh, I don't think anyone, you know, the qualitative uh, uh, evaluation of presidents doesn't take into account the challenges and the context in which they sat as president. Uh, no one, I think, has sat in, uh, in the presidency at such a critical time. The only one, maybe FDR, may approach that. He presided over the Great Depression and uh, basically uh, World War II. Uh, but I still think the greatest crisis was, uh, had to be dealt with by Lincoln. Much of this had to do with slavery. Slavery was a paramount issue at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have lots of terms uh, applied to the slavery issue and to Lincoln, for example, the great emancipator. Was he born with this strong feeling against slavery? Was it in his early family or did it evolve? Do you help us in that area? Yeah, it's a, a long uh, evolution uh, from his uh, boyhood uh, to the time he becomes president and deals with the issue of slavery. Uh, certainly as a young boy, uh, his parents, uh, Thomas, uh, his father in particular, had a, a strong bias against slavery. They were in Kentucky. Uh, they were poor farmers, and uh, but they did see around them 
uh, slaveholders, and there's a little, uh, quite a bias against, uh, from poor working uh, folk against uh, slavery in Kentucky. And in fact, it will prompt his move, uh, the family's movement to Indiana, and uh, then uh, as Lincoln is a young man, then will leave home and uh, head towards Illinois. Uh, and he carried with him, the, I think, his uh, parental uh, you know, uh, essentially bias against uh, the institution of slavery and what it meant, that it was fundamentally evil. I don't think in his early days he necessarily was militantly uh, set upon the destruction of slavery, uh, but uh, he certainly carried a bias uh, when he was young. How big an issue was slavery at that time? Well, it certainly begins to heat up. In uh, in fact, it's the uh, you know Lincoln only served as uh, in government as a U.S. Uh, con uh, congressman from Illinois at the very moment when the uh, Mexican War broke out in 1846. Uh, he has identified himself with the Whig Party, uh, which uh, at least the northern wing of that party is becoming. Uh, increasingly, uh, you know, biased against the ex expansion of slavery in the country. Uh, not necessarily where slavery has traditionally existed in the Deep South, uh, but of course the Mexican War is going to carry the prizes of vast territories to the West. And uh, Lincoln, uh, by that time, was adamantly opposed to the extension of slavery into the new territories that were gained from the Mexican War. And when Lincoln actually ran for the presidency and eventually was elected, was slavery a primary issue in that election? Oh, by the time of 1860, it certainly was. Uh, uh, again, uh, throughout the 1850s, uh, Lincoln did not serve uh, in Congress. There was a tradition with the Whigs that uh, you serve one term and then you hand it over to someone else. Uh, but during the 1850s, he was practicing largely law during that period, uh, but he uh, continued to maintain a very active interest in the political uh, life of the country. I think his attitude was reflective of the majority Whig opinion, at least up until 1854 when the party basically self-destructed. Uh, but up, up to that point, he's, I think, more of what we would call a free soiler, and that is uh, those who oppose any new territories uh, be having slavery introduced into them. Uh, it's a basic idea that uh, while we won't attack slavery in the traditional Deep South, we're going to keep it corralled and keep it uh, maintained uh, in, uh, in that area. And, and with the idea that it would suffocate, as, asphyxiate, and eventually it would be on the road to extinction down the line. But he's very adamant that slavery is not to be introduced into the new lands. Extinction or expansion became uh, major issues in the famous uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates. It does, and it uh, also was on, uh, you know, in the national debate uh, as well, you know, in the halls of Congress. By the time of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, there have been uh, a number of events that have really uh, put slavery, and as you said, expansion or extinction in many respects, uh, at the focal point of the whole national debate. It's really the only issue by 1854 that matters in this country. Everything else is quite peripheral. And uh, Lincoln's position is conditioned by the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. You know, those of us in Wisconsin are familiar down the road with uh, Ripon as the birthplace of the GOP. And, uh, and basically, uh, when uh, Stephen Douglas, his opponent in the great debate, when he uh, essentially supported the uh, and pushed and advocated for the Kansas to be open to the settlers who would move there as to yay or nay on slavery, uh, Lincoln's position is very clearly after that that he uh, um, uh, he is going to uh, become political along the lines of uh, confronting slavery. That this was a uh, this was a travesty, and so we have the birth of the Republican Party, 
that essentially comes out of the ashes of the old Whig party because uh, the Whigs could not confront in a unified way, north or south, uh, this issue of slavery. By this the is a good time to take our first break. You hold that thought. By all means. We'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Your Law and my guest, Dr. Tom Rowland, who is uh, bringing us up to date on the evolution of the slavery issue, especially leading up to and during the presidency of President Lincoln and how essential it was to understanding the slavery issue and understanding the things that led up to the Civil War. Why don't you take it from where you left it in the first segment, Tom? By all means. Uh, we left off really with uh, the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, which uh, because of the inability of uh, the Whig Party to take a uh, it divided along northern and southern lines to take a firm position on the expansion, potential expansion of slavery in, in Kansas. Uh, essentially in the wake of that, uh, the Whigs have basically disintegrate. We have, at least in the north, the emergence of the Republican Party, which have fundamentally, at its, uh, at its origins, it is a party that is at least unified on the one position which is to oppose further expansion of slavery on the continent. Um, now, after we go a little bit past there, uh, there's another important decision related to uh, the slave Dred Scott, the famous Dred Scott decision that will be made. Uh, Dred Scott was a slave who was attached to an army surgeon who had been uh, uh, located in Missouri, but then was transplanted up north or transferred up north. Uh, to a non-slave state. To a non-slave state. And on the basis of that, uh, Dred Scott, with support from outsiders who are, of course, anti-slavery, uh, are going to contest the fact that since he was introduced into a, uh, a region that, was, uh, that barred slavery, that he should, in fact, uh, you know, maintain his freedom. Um, the Supreme uh, Court at that time, Roger B. Taney, the Chief Justice, will rule on two levels. One is Dred Scott, uh, by constitutional description, was not, a, uh, was not a citizen, had no right actually to have a case introduced into law. Um, he was property, and as property, uh, and defined as such, uh, property could be transferred anywhere, and it did not deny the property owner the right to retain the property. More importantly, it is also, uh, the implication is very clear that if a slave could be brought into an area, a northern state, that barred slavery, uh, but remain, you know, remain a slave, then the implication is very clear that slavery can, in effect, uh, then exist anywhere if property is brought into a place. Uh, this, I think, further galvanizes uh, Republican opposition to uh, the forces that seem to dominate uh, the political scene as far as uh, being pro-Southern and pro-slave. And so they'll intensify that. And then, you know, we next see Lincoln really uh, in his run for the Senate seat in Illinois in his contest against uh, uh, Stephen A. Douglas, uh, uh, undoubtedly, or I think inarguably, the, the strongest Democratic figure in the country at the time. Uh, of course, he had been the author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, and of course is going to still argue uh, that uh, you know slavery is guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, slavery should uh, basically have the opportunity to be introduced into northern territories since the Missouri Compromise line had been repealed. Uh, Lincoln is uh, in a series of, well, I think it was seven debates throughout uh, uh, Illinois in that time, will uh, begin to articulate very clearly that uh, if you refer to the Declaration of Independence, that at least on a political or citizenship, uh, well, not so much citizenship basis, but on the, uh, you know, all men are created equal, that on that basis alone there is something fundamentally flawed and evil about the institution. Nonetheless, he is not articulating at this point any assault on slavery 
in the Deep South, although he fundamentally believes that it uh, once corralled and left there, it would suffocate and, and, and end up uh, extinguished. Uh, at one point, he, he indicates in one of his uh, debates that this issue is so fundamentally divisive in this country, he's essentially saying uh, at one point it would appear that uh, the issue is heading to a point where either, you know, this country is going to be all free or all slave. And, uh, and of course, he is not arguing for an all slave uh, position. Uh, then, of course, we know that he lost uh, that election. Uh, it was actually fairly narrow. He actually carried a slight plurality. Uh, but decisions on senators where there really weren't direct election of senators, these things were worked out in the state legislature. So he's not going to get the, the necessary districts uh, to win. But then, of course, he's going to emerge as a, uh, out of these debates as the kind of uh, a real prominent spokesperson uh, as a Republican who is standing in opposition to the pro-slave uh, forces. Uh, and then, of course, we enter into the election of 1860, and of course, he wins. And now he inherits uh, the secession crisis, because as soon as he was elected, as, uh, as threatened by the southern states, at least seven of them at first, uh, they march out of the country into secession. And uh, then, of course, that is going to invariably lead to a showdown in South Carolina. Uh, and uh, Confederate forces, a new government has been formed down there uh, in the interim between Lincoln's election and his actually his inauguration. So the moment he walked in, he was looking into a situation where seven states had seceded. Now the issue is going to be, well, what's going to happen? Now he's in his inauguration, he's not threatening the South, but he very cleverly works them into a dilemma and that is that federal installation, Fort Sumter, that is in the middle of Charleston Harbor. Uh, he maintains that this is a federal installation and it will be supported by the northern government. Uh, Confederates, uh, obviously, this is an embarrassment to them. Uh, on April 12, 1861, uh, the batteries surrounding Fort Sumter fire on it, precipitate the surrender and effectively the beginning of the Civil War. Um, then, of course, we now have a war. Um, as it comes to it, uh, the war uh, and all of the assumptions and all of the strategies related uh, to the prosecution of the war, at least through 1861, well into 1862, is that the war from the Northern point of view and Lincoln's point of view is merely uh, to put down the treason, put down secession, and restore the Union. Uh, nowhere implied during that time was the, uh, ass any assault upon Southern institutions, i.e. slavery, and he maintains that. The issue here is, is that the course of the war uh, over the first year uh, is, is not going well. Uh, there's a lot of reverses and uh, Lincoln grows into this understanding that there's a lot more support for secession, which he didn't think at the beginning there was, but there apparently is a lot more for that uh, and that uh, something needs to be thought uh, out. Let's take our second break at this point because I want to come back in the final segment and get your thoughts about Lincoln as a commander-in-chief. Okay. We'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Your Law with Dr. Tom Rowland, and he was discussing with us the evolution of the issue of slavery as we enter into and progress through the Civil War. Please continue with that. Yes, it's, uh, we left it uh, with ex essentially the first year of the war. Uh, the war, uh, from the northern point of view, is really not going that well. Uh, and part of the reason, I think, and Lincoln, I think, seized upon this fairly early, and that is uh, the war was being fought with uh, no uh, threat 
imposed against the uh, institution of slavery, uh, and of course the uh, in the South, and the and of course the, it was slavery that really supported uh, the entire uh, Southern war effort. Uh, you know, the population of the South in 1860 uh, was nine million, but four million of those were slaves, and they are the ones who are supporting essentially the economic engine that keeps the war going. Uh, Lincoln is convinced the war needs to be ratcheted up and that uh, some kind of an assault against uh, the institution of slavery is necessary. Uh, in June of 1862, he's still uh, a little bit hesitant. There's a famous exchange from an editor, Horace Greeley, out of New York, uh, who wrote him, urging him for emancipation. And uh, Lincoln responds back to him saying, Here's the deal, basically, if I could uh, save the Union and free all of the slaves, I would do that. If I could free the Union and free no slaves, I would do that. And then he said, if I could free some and keep others enslaved to save the Union, I would do that as well. But it's, uh, you know, that is his position then. But by July of 1862, he has uh, decided that uh, uh, that he will need to um, emancipate the slaves, at least those slaves that were in the then existing 11 states of the Confederacy. And uh, he does that. Uh, he's cautioned not to announce it immediately in July because the war is going very badly. To issue that would sound, uh, at that time, as one author said, the last shriek on the retreat and that is it would sound like a desperate action by a loser. In September, even though it wasn't an overwhelming victory, the Battle of Antietam is fought in the North. Uh, McClellan uh, stops Lee's invasion of the North, turns him back. It's a sufficient enough victory. This enables Lincoln then uh, to announce uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. It will go into effect on January 1, 1863. So it was an evolving thing, somewhat uh, forced on him by desperation, uh, losing a war. Yes, exactly. I think that's the key thing. You know, Lincoln has this uh, reputation as the great emancipator, as if he freed the slave. The truth of the matter is, it was really the course of the war and where it was going that prompted him uh, to make this move. And so in some respects, it really was a military measure as much as it was a fundamental uh, assault on slavery, leading it to uh, abolition. You know. We're running short of time, and there were other things I wanted to ask you about because your insights are so interesting. Two of them, and just time for a brief comment on each one. How was Lincoln as a commander-in-chief and uh, how strong was he in terms of taking over the powers of presidency and some said a lot more than the powers of presidency. All right, if I have the opportunity, maybe I'll try to make a remark at least upon the, the, la the, the second of your questions, and that is uh, when the, uh, the war began, uh, you have to understand that uh, Washington, D.C. is veritably surrounded by slavery. Uh, Maryland was a slave state, although it remained in the Union. Uh, but very early on, there were, there were clear indications, such as riots against uh, Union volunteers that were coming through the city. Uh, Baltimore and the eastern part of Maryland were very secessionist uh, and very uh, pro-slavery. Uh, this kind of violence, and Lincoln realized that this, in this place it could not be tolerated. And so very quickly he is going to institute martial law in Baltimore. He is going to essentially suspend by executive power, although the Constitution seemed to indicate maybe Congress should do this. Uh, but he's going on his own authority of suspending the writ of habeas corpus. And so we will see what will, might be described as arbitrary arrest. Uh, the Supreme Court Justice Roger B. Taney is actually going to announce in his position as a circuit court judge as well that uh, that Lincoln's action was unconstitutional. 
Uh, Lincoln just ignores them. That's all there is to it. And then uh, a little bit later, there was going to be a, a convening of the state legislature out in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, it was clear that there was uh, some anti-union uh, sentiment there. Uh, Lincoln will uh, inform uh, General McClellan, the commander of the Army uh, of the Potomac now, uh, simply to go out to Frederick and prevent uh, the convening of the legislator, legislature. So he understood his role that this is a crisis unlike any other, you know, that had happened in the Republic up to that point, and that it simply was a matter of necessity uh, that, uh, that this happened. Washington could not be surrounded. Thank you. This time has gone very fast, but I can't think of anybody better than you, Tom, to give us a picture of what Lincoln was facing and how he handled it. Great. Really enjoyed it, George. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, there you have it. I want to thank Dr. Rowland for his scholarship and aiding us in understanding our great 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. We can get another point of view by taking a trip through the battlefields of the South, and we can tell very quickly that there's another segment of our country that doesn't see Abe Lincoln, the 16th president, as the greatest president. I still think so. As a matter of fact, what impresses me most about Abraham Lincoln is his courage and confidence in appointing all of his rivals for the presidency to his cabinet. So he was surrounded by people who thought they were more qualified than he was, and in some instance, probably they were right, and yet he was able to bring all of that strength and power and wisdom together for a great presidency. That's my opinion. I'm George Curtis.